Good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Dave Allard. I am so pleased to have you folks here. I've got the participants growing as I'm watching my screen here. We're over 100 now. I think we have over a couple hundred folks reg registered for this event. Uh, I want to first uh, do a big, big thank you to, uh, to to Jackie, Michelle, Samantha, Julia, Beth, and Joel Lubenow, who had the idea for this meeting some two years ago. Uh, we've been working frantically on this for the past several months. Uh, it's a, it's a just a great, great, a uh, lot of fun to to pull this together. We're here to give honor to uh, Madam Curie, who actually visited the uh, College of Physicians and the museum uh, just a hundred years ago today. I hope her weather was as nice as it is here in Pennsylvania today. Um, I just wanted to get a quick go, a quick introduction to the folks you're going to uh, see and hear, and uh, a panel discussion at the end. Um, there are uh, the first uh, again big thanks to Jack, Jackie Bowman, who's the director of the Center for Education, co-director uh, and acting co uh, uh, director for the uh, living exhibits at the College of Physicians. We have a, a great panel, uh, a lineup of presenters today. Uh, myself, uh, uh, Dave Allard, I'm the director of the Bureau of uh, Radiation Protection here in the Commonwealth. Um, we've got uh, a um, introduction by Jackie. They have a brand new exhibit uh, of the uh, piezoelectric uh, device uh, at the at the museum, which Jackie's going to go through. Um, we've got a wonderful introduction by uh, Dr. Robert Hicks, who was the director who, of the museum, who can't be with us today, but nice one minute vid video of, of uh, Robert. Uh, and uh, uh, right after that, Robert is actually, we're gonna do a little time travel. Uh, Robert is actually interviewing Madame Curie. Uh, we have uh, Susan Marie uh, Fonsac, who's uh, uh, a performer, uh, educator, uh, scholar, uh, Madame Curie. And uh, we have a wonderful video of, of Robert interviewing Madame Curie. And then we have um, uh, a, a wonderful presentation by Joel Lubenow, a colleague of mine. Uh, Joel uh, came, came through the health department here in Pennsylvania, was with the Atomic Energy Commission, NRC, um, and, a, and, a, and a really a, a, a great scholar on the production of radium here in the, uh, in the US um, and in Pennsylvania. Um, unfortunately, uh, Joel's colleague uh, Paul, uh, Ed Landa couldn't couldn't be with us today. Um, but after that, we've got uh, uh, Bert Corsi. Uh, Bert's uh, retired from the National Bureau of Standards slash uh, NIST. Uh, Bert's got decades of of uh, radiation uh, and radioactivity standards uh, uh, work with the with the NBS. And and it was actually the National Bureau of Standards uh, that uh, Madame Curie visited while she was in Washington. Um, to receive her gram of radium, that was uh, a gift from the women of America, um, and, uh, and and Bert's going to be discussing that. Uh, and then after Bert's uh, presentation, we've got uh, Jeffrey Womack. Jeff's a uh, historian, uh, degrees in, in history, and has done a lot of work at the college and museum, uh, developing their website on on radium, and uh, has a wonderful new book out, uh, Radiation Evangelist. And then I'm going to wind up with a, um, a little brief uh, history on, uh, on radium in Pennsylvania. And then uh, we'll, we'll close this out and then open it up for panel discussion. And we're going to have everybody on the panel, including Paul Frame, who's, who's with us today. Uh, Dr. Frame has uh, been with Oak Ridge for decades, a big educator, done a lot of work in, in, in radiation protection over the decades. And uh, Paul has amassed an amazing collection uh, of instruments uh, uh, radiation-related instruments and, and, and quackery, uh, which, uh, which I'm, I want to feature a little bit at the end here. So right now I'd like to, and, and I want to just again mention to everybody, just if you have a, a Word document open, just be ready at the end of this whole thing to, to jot down um, a code and, and some web links or a piece of paper and pencil. As Susan Marie Franzak and, and her colleague, um, uh, Jen uh, from uh, STEM on stage, are gonna be performing this evening. And I've got a slide on this at the end, which you can jot all this information down. They're actually gonna be, she's gonna be performing as Madame Curie. I had a preview of this a couple of weeks ago and it's wonderful. Uh, she's, she's incredible. Um, and it's like you've spent an evening with Madame Curie. Very, very inspirational to any, any families with uh, children, say over nine, 10 years old uh, that might be interested in STEM, the history of science or medicine, so. I think at that point, at this point, I think we'll we'll just uh, get started. And oh, by the way, one one other thing I wanted to mention, everybody, everybody that's registered uh, for the meeting will get a a, do a couple documents. Um, one is a 
a paper that uh, Dr. Hicks did on the piezoelectric device in this uh, wonderful old journal, uh, Rittenhouse. Um, we got permission from the publisher to uh, send that out to all the attendees. And you'll get a Word document with a lot of links to all of the folks uh, uh, of research that are on this uh, in, uh, agenda and presentation. So um, again, uh, encourage you to uh, you know, do, your, do further research after this. This has been a lot of fun putting this to together. And again, thank you, everybody. And one last thing I just need to mention is stay, stay on um, at the end for the Q&A. And if you have questions through through the um, uh, through the uh, presentations here, just type your questions into the Q and A. Uh, just hit the button Q and A, and then uh, Jackie will be reading these uh, once we get to the Q and A session for us to to address. So, hopefully, I got that done in a couple of minutes here, and we'll get started. Thank you. Welcome to the College of Physicians of Philadelphia, the oldest continuously operating medical society in the United States. Today we celebrate a very important anniversary. 100 years ago, Marie Curie walked through these doors and came into our building. She was presenting a special piece of equipment to our collection. We are celebrating this centenary here at the college by creating a small case exhibit about the trip. Please come by and see it at the Mutter Museum. The piezoelectric apparatus, the oldest surviving instrument to measure radioactivity, takes pride of place in our new exhibit, telling the story of Madame Curie's visit to the USA and her quest for a gram of radium. She then came upstairs to this beautiful Mitchell Hall that you can see around me here, which was filled with physicians interested to hear about this new technology that she was a part of. She was very tired, but she spoke for a while and presented the piezoelectric apparatus to the college. She said the following when she did. It gives me pleasure to present this apparel quartz piezoelectric for such purpose as its historic interest will serve. It was designed by Professor Curie and is one of those used by us in our early research work for measuring the radioactivity of radium. Having served its purpose, it was replaced by other apparatus. I love how practical she was. Please enjoy the centennial celebration that we are having here at the college today May 23rd, 2021. Thank you. This is a family treasure, not just because it's in the family of museums in Philadelphia, but because of the family that made it and used it. Pierre and Marie Curie, celebrity scientists in their day. Marie Curie won two Nobel Prizes. She gave this instrument to us. Open it up, it looks simple. Quartz crystal connected to a pan. Put weights in the pan, creates pressure on the crystal, and the crystal gives off electrons. These are parts of an atom and they are measured. This is used to measure radioactivity. This was built in the early 1880s by Pierre, one of the earliest, if not the earliest, instrument for measuring radioactivity. You can see this, so come visit us at the Mutter Museum of the College of Physicians of Philadelphia. Ninety years ago, a significant event happened at the College of Physicians of Philadelphia. Probably the most famous scientist in the world was visiting the United States, Dr. Marie Curie, and she came to the College of Physicians. Well, by an amazing arrangement with the cosmos, we have been able to get Dr. Curie to appear in an interview with us. Hi, I'm Robert Hicks, director of the Mutter Museum and Historical Medical Library of the College of Physicians of Philadelphia, and welcome to another episode of No Bones About It. Dr. Curie, thank you very much for making uh, space available in your schedule to allow me to interview you today. Certainly. And uh, as you know, I've come all the way here to Paris to interview you about your work. And I won't interrupt you long from your laboratory work, 
but I'm representing the College of Physicians of Philadelphia, and there's great interest among physicians about the promise of radioactivity in medicine. What is your view of that? Uh, certainly, uh, it has uh, gotten great attention that this application uh, of uh, radium and radioactivity can be, it appears, used to cure cancer. I receive hundreds of letters every week from people either asking me to cure them of cancer or thanking me for discovering something which saved their life. Now, at first, uh, my husband, uh, we were curious what would happen biologically, and he placed a sample of this uh, radium barium product on his arm, and we observed every day what uh, happened after it was on there for a few hours. Because his own mother had died of cancer just uh, shortly before I began my study of this radioactivity, we then turned to the medical community. Uh, doctors Balthazar and Bouchard here in Paris uh, conducted further experiments and indeed were able to cure several patients of cancer. Since that time, I understand now they are not applying radium directly, but uh, from a radium sample, it has a gaseous emanation. And if you keep this in an uh, enclosed capsule, you can draw off this gaseous emanation, which is itself radioactive, and place that in the body cavity where the cancer appears. I am not directly uh, involved in this research. Uh, my own research is on the fundamental physical and chemical properties of radioactive substances. But uh, in the uh, Radium Institute of Paris, I manage one wing with this fundamental research on the uh, Institut Pasteur. Uh, they will conduct uh, these experiments, medical experiments. The only competition we have is that we have only one gram of radium between us, and uh, everyone wants access to this uh, very precious sample. Since you bring up radium, uh, obviously there's no greater authority on the substance than yourself. Uh, many claims are now being made, even in advertisements in uh, magazines for physicians in the United States. It's become the cure-all element. It's the miracle element. Uh, should we get our expectations up about the promise of radium? I do not subscribe to any of these outlandish claims. Some people want to put it in their drinking water. They claim it makes them uh, either healthy or more uh, energy. Uh, some claim you should put it in your toothpaste or some such. I, I cannot make any recommendations along these lines whatsoever, and I uh, fully suspect most of them are uh, sham. And uh, so I would caution anyone who is contemplating uh, placing radioactive substances on their body or in them that they should really uh, get some better advice before going ahead just because of these advertisements. Well, the word radioactivity is now in universal use, whereas a few years ago this was an unknown term, but thanks to your work uh, it's now the new phenomenon of nature. Uh, we also have x-rays. What's the relationship between the two? These are often confused. Uh, in part because now with this terrible war taking over Europe, I have become involved in some way with uh, X-rays, so people confuse X-rays and radioactivity. They are not the same thing. Um, X-rays were discovered by German scientist, uh, Dr. William Röntgen, in 1895, uh, 96, somewhere about there and uh, everyone was interested in this phenomenon, to take picture inside the body, very interesting. And uh, it was a few years later that I, with my husband, uh, discovered radioactivity, or that is, we chose the word, we created this word radioactivity to describe this 
unusual property that certain elements give off rays spontaneously. You cannot speed it up, you cannot slow it down. Whereas X-rays, you must put energy in, you must put uh, electricity in uh, with the cathode ray tube, you can create a ray. So they're very different. One, you must, uh, and you have conservation of energy. You put energy in in electricity, it comes out as X-ray. And uh, with radioactivity, the substance is automatically giving off these rays. But through these experiments of Dr. Rutherford, it appears that some of the um, particles being carried in the air with X-rays and with radioactivity, some of the particles are the same. So we still have much research to do. Now, during this war, I have found that X-rays can be very useful in helping to diagnose uh, for the wounded. Uh, if a soldier gets a piece of shrapnel or bullet in his body, you cannot tell from entry wounds where this has lodged in the body. And if uh, you are a surgeon and must operate on this uh, soldier, and open up the body to try to find this pieces of metal. If you leave the body open for too long, the soldier will die. But if you miss a piece, then the soldier can die from infection or maybe have a loss of limb from infection. So it is a dilemma. How long do you look and what do you look for? But with X-ray, it was difficult. I had to convince the French army that uh, a woman had the idea on how these doctors should operate. But with X-ray, with uh, appropriate uh, views and a little geometry, you can tell exactly where in the, every piece that is there. And a surgeon can make appropriate decision about whether it should be removed or not. But they can operate much more quickly. And with 2,000 casualties a day, day after day, it is... Uh, we want to save as many lives as we can. So I have used uh, my savings from the second Nobel Prize in 1911 and used it to purchase a dynamo where we can create electricity from a running automobile engine. Uh, a number of French citizens have donated their automobiles and I have installed this dynamo and gotten the cathode ray tube, so we have now mobile x-ray units. If the soldiers are too ill to travel long distance to hospital, we can take these x-rays right near the front lines. I have obtained my driver's license and I drive one of these vehicles myself. So does my daughter, she's 17. And, uh, the soldiers call them little curies. Well, I'm wondering if uh, the threat of war grows even bigger. It might affect the United States in some way, but here you are producing these innovations. Final question. Uh, I'll return to the United States. Do you have a message for physicians in the United States about how they should be viewing these technologies, X-ray ambulances, or the promise of radium? There is so much more to understand about these substances, both medically and uh, in the fundamental research. I only hope they will continue what research they can. All of our institutions are closed during the war. All the men have gone to war. So we cannot even conduct basic research at this time. So I hope uh, so far away from the war that uh, this research can continue. And I am eager to uh, reopen our own Radium Institute once the war comes to close. Well, I wish you every success in that work, and I hope that you will find that the United States will be, in every respect, a supporter of your work. But thank you very much for joining us today. Merci. Good afternoon. It is my pleasure to describe to you some of the equipment that my husband, Dr. Pierre Curie, and I use in measuring radioactivity. Uh, but first, I think you would be interested in knowing a little background on this piezoelectric scale that my husband invented, this uh, scale based on properties he discovered of these piezoelectric quartz. You can grow this kind of crystal in the laboratory. 
This grew out of a childhood interest he had, a fascination with the topic of symmetry in all natural phenomena, a, a, a leaf, a, a butterfly, a flower, uh, something where you can draw a line and it is mirror image, one side or the other. Especially he was interested in crystals. And he, working with his brother Jacques Curie, discovered a very special property of this quartz crystal that if placed under tension, such as this, then it will generate electric charge. They theorized and then proved the opposite also, that if you take a quartz crystal and expose it to electric current, it will deform on its own very slightly. They named this property piezoelectrics, and uh, it has proved invaluable in our own experiments. At first, uh, this was before even I came to Paris, before we had met. He managed to create a very special sort of scale that could, through these very tiny deformations of the crystal, weigh very, very small quantities. So you could either uh, measure the electricity by place, placing a weight on the scale, so, or you could uh, measure the weight of an unknown object by uh, measuring the electricity that it produced when this crystal was stretched. Now, several years later, when I was interested in measuring these uh, rays given off by particular elements, certain elements in our world, uranium and thorium, and then these two elements that we discovered, radium and polonium, in order to measure the strength of the rays given off, we wanted to measure the conductibility created in the air ionized by these rays. But these were very tiny, tiny currents uh, maybe 50 picoamperes, 50 trillionths of an ampere. So to measure these very feeble currents, we had a more elaborate apparatus, but uh, relying on this piezoelectric scale. And uh, the centerpiece of this was an electrometer in which there is a, a tiny mirror suspended from a wire and this is a quadrant electrometer so that if you set up one potential, one voltage across uh, two of the quadrants and another voltage across the other, the mirror will turn like a torsional spring. And uh, you could imagine being on a swing and if you turn the ropes, it will want to turn back. So with uh, a wire going from this stretch device, you place a weight on the piezoelectric quartz. You have a wire at one end of this quartz to go to two of the quadrants and a ground wire going to your ground. Then with a certain weight, you can charge up the mirror and it will turn on its spring. You then open up a switch here between these devices and you place your radioactive sample in the chamber here. This also has a wire to the opposite quadrants and a ground wire. And then you close a switch here and you begin to discharge the charge that you built up that turned to the mirror. And uh, I use my watch and I, the mirror reflects a light along here when I charge it up and I time how long does it take to discharge to measure the strength of the radioactivity. Now this is very delicate operation. You must have everything very clean. You must take each measurement multiple times and then average your numbers. The humidity and temperature will change your measurements. Perhaps one of the most difficult pieces of this is that when we began studying, I had a sample that was maybe four times as radioactive as uranium. 
but by the time we isolated pure radium, almost four years later, I had a sample that was a million times more radioactive than pure uranium. And because of this, we had many orders of magnitude to try to determine how to balance and, and measure with this very sensitive device. Well, thank you. On May 19, 1921, Marie Curie arrived in New York City on the White Star Liner Olympic to accept the gift of, of a gram of radium from the women of America. She was accompanied by her daughters, Eve standing on the left and Irene standing on the right. And in the center, by the driving force behind Curie's visit, Mrs. Marie Mattingly Brown Melanie. Mrs. Melanie, an American journalist and editor, had repeatedly asked to interview Marie Curie. Finally, Curie consented, and in May 1920, she met Curie in her laboratory in Paris. Curie began the interview by speaking how fortunate America was in having so much radium, rattling off names of American cities and quantities of radium in each. Melanie, Melanie asked the obvious question, how much had she? Her reply was that uh, she had none. What was there belonged to the laboratory, and most of it was dedicated to medical purposes. To continue her research, more radium was need, needed, another gram. But she could not buy it because it was too expensive. From that interview emerged a plan by Melanie to secure a gram of radium for Curie to be paid by the American women of America. The contract to produce the radium was awarded to a Pittsburgh company, Standard Chemical Company. Curie had nothing to do with the fundraising, but when it was completed, Melanie prevailed upon her to come to America to accept the gift in a presentation at the White House by President Warren G. Harding. Her itinerary was expanded to six and a half weeks in America to allow time to visit American education, research, government, and industrial institutions, of which many wished to bestow honors on her. For her own part, she asked only to visit the Grand Canyon, Niagara Falls, and, the Pits and Pittsburgh, because, to quote her, it is the place where the greatest amount of radium in the world is produced, end quote. Her 46 day itinerary was full and tightly scheduled, calling for 30 stops in towns and cities in 12 states plus Washington DC with only one day set aside for rest. She was 53 years old and suffered from low blood pressure, dizziness and anemia problems that affected her stamina. In fact, she would be frequently fatigued by the demands of a schedule and events had to be curtailed, postponed, or canceled. Curie began visiting American women's colleges earlier in her trip, beginning with Smith College, which awarded her its first honorary degree. It's noteworthy that she visited seven women's colleges during her trip. During her visit to America, she spoke publicly at length only once, and that was at Vassar, where she spoke about the discovery of radium, ending it with a wish, quote, it is my own earnest desire that some of you should carry on the scientific work and keep for your ambition, the determination to make a permanent contribution to science, end quote. In 1921, Marie Curie was well known, possibly the most famous woman in the world. She was esteemed by American women, particularly those in academia. Her stay in New York City was highlighted by a reception on May 18th by the Association of American University Women at Carnegie Hall, where 3,500 members crowded into the hall to honor her. It was the largest audience assembled for Curie during her visit. But already concerns were about her health were surfacing. On May 20th, she traveled to Washington DC where President Harding presented her a certificate of gift for the gram of radium at the White House. 
The following days in Washington were spent visiting government laboratories attending and attending official functions. She was scheduled to leave Washington on the morning of the 23rd for Philadelphia to attend a luncheon, accept honorary degrees from the Women's Medical College of Pennsylvania and the University of Pennsylvania, and attend training at the College of Physicians of Philadelphia in the evening. Instead, finding herself badly fatigued, she delayed her departure from Washington and sent her daughters ahead to accept the honorary degrees on her behalf. Later, she arrived in Philadelphia in time for the College of Physicians of Philadelphia meeting. The next day, May 24th, was an especially long one. First, she abetted her schedule to stop by the Women's Medical College of Pennsylvania to thank Dean Dr. Martha Tracy for its honorary degree and spent the rest of the day and evening attending official functions. It was not until 11 p.m. that she and her party had boarded a train to Pittsburgh. On the morning of the 25th, Marie Curie arrived in Pittsburgh, utterly exhausted. First newspaper reports were dire. Because of her ill health and weariness, her trips to the radium plants in Pittsburgh would be canceled as well as her planned tour of the Western United States. Events for that day were postponed and she spent it resting. The following day, somewhat recovered, she attended a University of Pittsburgh convocation where she received an honorary doctor of laws. But to conserve her energy, the ceremony was shortened to 15 minutes and afterwards her daughters stood in for her at the reception. Prior to the convocation, she visited Standard Chemical Company's radium laboratories in Pittsburgh. Standard Chemical Company was founded by two brothers, James and Joseph Flannery, undertakers, originally turned into industrialists. Joseph served as com company president and James was a board member. Standard Chemical was the first American company to produce radium. Commercial production began in 1913, and within a short time, it became the largest producer of radium. Radium became readily available, but it was expensive. The prevailing price of radium was $120,000 per gram, but Stan Chemical offered to produce Curie's gram at a discounted price of $100,000. By 1920, the company had produced over half of the world's supply of radium. The same year the brothers passed away to succeed Joseph Flannery, the company board elected its legal counsel, James Gray, president. On May 26th, Curie visited the company's plant in Cannonsburg, south of Pittsburgh, where the radium was extracted from the ore. Seen here at the Cannonsburg plant, a visibly frail, Marie Curie leans on President Gray's arm. On the left facing them is Louis Vogt, the plant manager. Afterwards, a Pittsburgh Sun reporter wrote how her demeanor changed during her visit, and quoting in part, between vast tanks, past steaming press filtration rooms where the fumes rising from the liquid almost gag on, in the carbonating department where the raw ore is treated in a soda ash wash, Marie Curie seems strangely in place. Bareheaded, with wisp of gray hair blowing around about her anxiously wrinkled forehead, dressed simply in black, Madame Curie seemed entirely in her own element, as she had not appeared since coming to America. Had come to the planet, obviously, a travel and reception one woman, seemingly too tired to walk even a short distance. Now, she, she emerged fresh and radiant. It was a remarkable ex exhibition of the ascendancy of the technical and scientific mind over the frail and weary body, end quote. It's a beautiful piece of writing 
but unfortunately the author is unknown. Marie Curie's visits to the Standard Chemical Company plants in Cannesburg and Pittsburgh became special moments for Lewis Vogt and James Gray. Vogt, in addition to hosting Curie's visit to the Cannonsburg plant, was invited, invited by Pittsburgh's radio station, KDKA, to talk about radium in a special broadcast. This was a singular honor because KDKA was America's first commercial radio station having gone on the air just the previous year and was the flagship station of the Westinghouse Broadcasting System. For Gray, on the left, his meeting with Marie Curie would have been a poignant occasion. Nine years earlier, a cancerous tumor was found on his spine. Surgery and x-ray treatments were not successful, and in fact, he suffered x-ray burns. But radium therapy, utilizing some of the company's earliest radium, was successful. Gray was a cancer survivor, owed his life to radium. One can only wonder what thoughts went through Gray's mind as he gently supported the arm of this frail, gray-haired woman, the co-discoverer of the element that saved his life. Afterwards, Curie left Pittsburgh and went to Melanie's home in New York City to again rest. Her trip to the West Coast was canceled, although she would travel to the Grand Canyon to fulfill her wish to see it. From there, she traveled to Chicago to receive honorary degrees from the Northwestern University and the University of Chicago, and the William Gibbs Medal from the American Chemical Society. Then to Buffalo, where she made her decide Niagara Falls, but again, fell ill. Scheduled events in Buffalo were canceled and she stayed at a friend's home to rest. The final leg of her trip included visits to Cambridge where Harvard President A. Lawrence Lowell presented over a reception at the Sanders Theater where Harvard President, where a thousand students, faculty and contributors to the Marie Curie Radium Fund attended. And finally, New Haven, where Yale University conferred one more honorary degree, her ninth from American colleges. Before leaving America, Marie Curie held a final meeting with the press in which she expressed admiration for America's scenic attractions, cities, and colleges. She expressed regret that her frail health had limited her visit and acknowledged it was linked to her work with radium and during World War I establishing mobile medical military x-ray units. After a bon voyage party, she sailed for France on the Olympic on Saturday, June 25th, arriving in Cherbourg on July 2nd, where government officials and children carrying flowers greeted her. And that, Briefly, it's a story how Marie Curie came to visit the United States 100 years ago. Besides the gift of the radium from the women of America, her trip was rewarding in other ways. Subscriptions to the Marie Curie Radium Fund exceeded $100,000. Moreover, Standard Chemical Company billed the fund only for $65,600 presumably the cost of producing the radium and eschewing any profit. Most of the ex excess money was placed into a trust fund for Curie. She also received $6,900 in awards and an advance of $50,000 from an American publisher for a biography of Pierre Curie. A lasting gift was her friendship with Mrs. Maloney one that endured until Marie Curie's death in 1934. She was 66 years old. The cause of death was a plastic anemia. Lastly, we are fortunate so many photographs were taken during her visit and those used in this, in this presentation came from these sources. Thank you.
Hi, I'm Bert Corsi. It's a great pleasure to join my fellow panelists this afternoon to celebrate the 100th anniversary of Marie Curie's visit to America. About 30 years ago, I found this old photo from the Pittsburgh Sun in a cheap frame on the top of a file cabinet in the back of a lab. I became fascinated trying to find out why we had this old photo. There were no records in the history of the Bureau of Standards that mentioned Curie's visit. Over the past 30 years, I've filled in many of the blanks. I found the connection between the Bureau and Marie Curie goes back to the International Congress on Radiology and Electricity in Brussels in 1910. They appointed an International Radium Standards Commission of 10 scientists who were working in the new field of radioactivity. Two of them were the Nobel Prize winners, Marie Curie from Paris and Ernest Rutherford from Manchester in the United Kingdom. The third key member was Stefan Meyer, head of the Institute for Radium Research in Vienna. The commission had three main assignments to establish the quantity and units for radioactivity, which they decided would be the Curie for one gram of radium. Secondly, they had to prepare primary standards. Marie Curie would prepare one in Paris and Stefan Meyer would have three others in Vienna. And the third assignment was to certify secondary standards that could be used to calibrate radium in nations around the world. The Austrian chemist Otto Hernigschmidt prepared the first secondary standards in 1912. And these went to France to Curie's laboratory the, the National Physical Laboratory in England and the Standards Laboratory of uh, Germany, which was then in Berlin. The second set was prepared in 1913 and those went to the USA and three other nations. Each secondary standard was measured by comparison with the gamma rays with the Paris and the Vienna standards. The USA was anxiously awaiting the receipt of their standard in 1913 and the director of the Bureau assigned a senior physicist to begin preparations for receipt of the standard. Noah Ernest Dorsey was given the assignment to design a national calibration service for the US. His first trip was to travel to Pittsburgh to learn as much as he could from Charles Vail at the Standard Chemical Company, the major supplier of radium for the world at that time. And the Bureau purchased two standards, a one milligram and a four milligram. The certificate for the four milligram standard is shown here. Dorsey set up a gold leaf electroscope and made measurements of the radium standards from Pittsburgh while he anxiously awaited the arrival of the, the secondary standard for the USA. Dorsey established he received the US uh, secondary standard the week after Christmas in 1913. Here's the certificate for the 15 milligram radium source. The certificate is given in three languages and signed by Marie Curie, Ernest Rutherford and Stefan Meyer. Dorsey compared the two standards, chemical company uh, Pittsburgh standards with standard number six using an electroscope that he either built or purchased and reported the results at the American Physical Society in April of 1914. Dorsey established a very lucrative national calibration service in 1914. And over the next six years, the Bureau calibrated all the radium sold for medical applications in the US and probably most of the radium exported to other countries during World War I when the US was the major supplier of radium. This small staff of 12 in fiscal year 1920 is shown here. It was an incredible turnover in staff. Um, by summer of 1920, nine of the 12 people shown here were gone. Dorsey, the section chief, resigned in July 1920 uh, to write a, a textbook on the physics of radioactivity. And he was replaced by Hiram Walter Hiram Wadley, uh, who had only been on the, on the staff for three weeks, but he had come to the Bureau during World War I uh, from the University of Arkansas as a physics professor. The third important staffer is Elizabeth E. Damon, 
is identified here as a lab assistant. Uh, but in fact, she had a, a baccalaureate degree in physics from the University of Vermont. Damon is shown here in this 1920 newspaper clipping handing a gram of radium valued at $120,000 to a representative of the Radium Chemical Company. The Radium Chemical Company is a subsidiary of the Standard Chemical Company of Pittsburgh. So this was likely a specimen from Pittsburgh that she had calibrated at the Bureau and she was providing them with the calibrated material. We can only hope that this is a ceremonial box rather than a gram of radium. We know from later years that she worked with Dorsey to calibrate all radium samples for medical sales during that year of 1920, but they both left in the summer of 1920. We don't have any good photos of Dorsey's uh, gold leaf electroscopes in those first few years, but these three show the early development and uses of the electroscopes. The photo on the left shows Mary Brower in 1922 with her face very close to the electroscope to record the drift rate of the gold foil. The photo on the right from 1927 shows Constance Torrey using a projection electroscope that affords the operator some distance from the radium sources and the, and the electroscope. More refined instruments like the ones shown below here were in place uh, in, in the, in the mid-1920s. But the important point to note is that Constance Torrey had replaced Elizabeth Damon and was performing the calibrations when Marie Curie's radium arrived in May of 1921. Mary Brower joined the, the section after that in 1922. Marie Curie's arrival in Washington 100 years ago was a major social event. The Washington Sun Star listed the eight scientists and 18 prominent local women who were part of the local organizing committee for her visit. The director of the Bureau of Standards, Samuel Wesley Stratton, uh, was a member of the scientific committee. The executive committee of women who would raise the $100,000 for the gift included uh, Mrs. Herbert Hoover, the, a future first lady, and also Alice Roosevelt Longworth, the first daughter of President Teddy Roosevelt. And she was the grand dame of Washington society for most of the 20th century. Curry arrived on a sleeper train from New York at 6.30 a.m. on Friday morning. And she had a little time to rest at the home of a local diplomat and then attended the White House ceremony in the afternoon. That evening, there was a large reception in her honor at the National Museum, which was soon renamed the Smithsonian. Saturday, she planned to attend two scientific institutions, the Bureau of Mines and the Bureau of Standards, and then visit uh, a sailing trip down the Potomac to visit Mount Vernon, and then dinner at the French Embassy. The only event scheduled for Sunday was a dinner at the Polish legation. The big event was the four o'clock ceremony at the White House to receive the gram of radium from President Harding. Many people have seen this famous photo of her descending the staircase at the White House with President Harding. I really like the one on the right where Harding seems to be sharing a joke with Irene Curie. In our archives at NIST, we found this fact sheet prepared by the White House for distribution to the attendees and to the press. It's an accurate description of the gram of radium and how it was packaged and presented. But it's interesting to think about how the Bureau of Scientists must have drafted this press release, the interactions they must have had with the White House press secretary. And this slide shows the certificate for the 10 100 milligram ampules that made up the gram. Uh, the ampules were compared by gamma ray measurements with the US secondary standard number six that Curie had provided in 1913. Uh, this elegant uh, certificate was signed by the Bureau Director S.W. Stratton. And we know for sure that Marie Curie visited the Bureau, possibly twice. She was scheduled to visit on Saturday morning, but which would be 100 years ago but apparently came yet again on Sunday morning. The bureau was kept open on that Sunday when she came with her daughter Irene to view the radium gift. 
and discuss the measurements with Hiram Wadley and others. This notation that we have here is an obscure note we found in other NIST records just recently. We should let Marie Curie have the last word on her visit to the Bureau. She says, I've visited with special interest the Bureau of Standards, a very important national institution in Washington for scientific measurements. And then she concludes, I had the great pleasure of meeting in their laboratory several very important American scientific men. The hours I spent in their company are among the best of my travels. It's great that she mentioned that her visit to the Bureau was among the best of her travels in America, but I hope she was also able to meet at least one of the outstanding women physicists who were actually performing the radium calibrations. The three young women shown here performed almost all the radium source calibrations between 1920 and 1950. They were all two years younger, two, one or two years younger than Irene, who, who looks very young at the time but each of them has a baccalaureate degree in physics and they were already responsible for the measurements of record. Uh, Marie Curie visited Smith College on her lecture tour. I hope she had an opportunity to meet their uh, recent graduate, Constance Torrey, who probably made the critical measurements for the gift for Marie. And I'd like to thank you again for allow me to participate this afternoon and I want to give special thanks to our NIST uh, researchers and to uh, Joel Lubenow, uh, Emeritus Health Physicist, for all the valuable materials, uh, research materials they've shared with me over the years. Thank you very much. Hi, Dave Allard again here. We're going to go live. Uh, Jeffrey, are you all set to share your... Yep, your I'm ready to go. Yeah. So I wanted to talk for just, uh, just briefly for a few minutes today. Um, about uh, the, kind of the other, what I think of as sort of the other founder of the feast for this event. Um, obviously, uh, Marie Curie is, is uh, kind of front and center for us here, but, um, but there's somebody else who's important. It's this guy in the corner, uh, Robert Abbey. And uh, Robert Abbey was um, a really interesting guy, um, really uh, pretty you know, famous in his own time as uh, as a sort of pioneering physician, any of you who uh, do any work with um, uh, plastic surgery have probably heard of the Abbey flap technique. Well, this is um, that guy, Robert Abbey. And he did, uh, he did a lot of work with plastic surgery because he was interested in cancer. And so he was really doing a lot of work with cancer and then kind of the other stuff he did flowed from that. So, um, so the flap technique, for instance, is a, is a way to repair uh, after removing. Um, cancer. So Abby was, a, was an interesting guy in lots of ways, though. He was a real Renaissance man, um, did a lot of cool stuff in his life. And one of the things that he was very interested in was the history of medicine and science. He was a member of the College of Physicians. He was a fellow. Uh, and so he, this picture down below, probably a lot of you have seen uh, over the years, was a, a case that was uh, in the kind of lobby um, at the at the Mütter Museum, and it had a bunch of artifacts in it. And uh, Robert Abbey is the guy who assembled these artifacts. And in fact, when you look at this, uh, this is the invitation down here on the bottom right uh, from the meeting where Marie Curie came. And you'll see that down here it says, Dr. Rab Dr. Robert Abbey of New York will present mementos of Lord Lister Louis Pasteur with a custodianship case. So he actually gave the, he gave the case right, so that they could stick it. Um, he uh, assembled, you know, got together some of these artifacts, accumulated some more, you know, he kind of was always, you know, was, was looking for some kind of cool stuff to stick in that case. Uh, but the highlight of these, you know, so he had gotten this stuff from Pasteur, this uh, uh, from Lister, you guys are probably seeing the carbolic acid sprayer that's in there. Um, but the, you know, the kind of, big thing was uh, was the quartz piezoelectrometer. And you can see this note uh, in the upper left-hand corner. This is, um, in fact, what Jackie read from earlier when she was reading uh, that, that what Marie Curie said about the case. And you'll see that it is addressed to Dr. Robert Abbey. And so, so an interesting question is like, so what was the relationship between Abbey and Curie and where did that come from? 
And the answer is that uh, Abby himself was one of the earliest researchers in the United States to work with radium. And he, uh, he found out, uh, kind of knew through the grapevine about the existence of this new substance and the possibility that it could be used in cancer treatment. And he knew that because, uh, you know, in general, folks had already been experimenting with using x-rays for cancer treatment. And so when radium came on the scene, uh, initially the idea, which proved to be wrong in basically every particular, was that, well, x-rays are a big pain to generate. You need all this electrical apparatus. But if you had something that just put off radiation all the time, like radium, well, then it would be a super cheap and easy way to treat people uh, for cancer. You wouldn't need all of this fancy apparatus. Of course, the reality ends up being radium is very expensive and hard to produce, right? Uh, so the dream doesn't initially come true. But Abby, uh, as soon as he kind of finds out about radium, sees that it is a possibility, starts to inquire, how could I get a hold of some of this stuff um, and try it out on some of my own cancer patients? And this is a couple of pieces of correspondence. And I, I should say, I'll put here in the chat window, um, all of the images that I'm using today are actually available in the, uh, in the college's exhibit, uh, an exhibit that I put together on, uh, it's called Healing Energy. And I'll just drop a URL link there in the chat window. Uh, so if you're interested in these and a lot of other cool images of documents that are in the college's collection, you can see them there online in high quality scans. You can download them and peer over them yourself. Um, so you can just see in this correspondence, uh, Abby writes to um, Imer and Eamon, the um, chemical distributors, uh, basically, I hear that this stuff exists, could you get me some, right? And the thing that I want to call your attention that's super interesting about it is uh, right here where it says, they say, we can't get any of it, it's going to be super expensive. We can't get even the smallest quantity because the only people that are making it are the Curies in their lab, right? Um, now this ends up being not entirely true. Uh, there are also some, some folks in Germany who are producing not pure radium, but radium salts. Um, and eventually Imer and Amond are able to kind of get a hold of some. But a, a kind of key thing to take away from this is if you were a physician working with radium, there is a very good chance that your radium actually came from the Curies, that it was from their lab. And in fact, here, this is much later. You can see the date on this is uh, 1914, but this is a receipt slip from, you know, the Curie's lab for some radium, you know, that's just going out uh, for medical use, right? They, they provided it and sold it partly as a way to fund their lab, partly because they were interested in, in supporting scientific research and the medical applications. But you can see down here, sorry, this is uh, hidden, right down here is at the bottom, if you look in the bottom right-hand corner, you'll see Madame Curie signed this receipt. Uh, hilariously, some of the materials in there in our collection from the Curie's lab have to be in plastic slipcases because everything in their lab was contaminated with radium. So it's also radioactive. Um, but uh, but so you, they, were, they were sending out these, you know, sending out these samples. So the Abbeys were in communication with the Curie's and, you know, needed those connections in order to get this incredibly precious substance, this in incredibly rare substance, uh, prior to standard chemical kind of making it much more widely available. So Abby maintained this correspondence with Curie uh, for years and years. And just something I'll, uh, I'm not going to say a lot about his own work. If you're interested in that, you're, uh, you can check it out, a discussion of it in my book. But here you can see um, on the left-hand side where he writes, in 1903, first radium experience, experiment self, right? So they had no idea what this was gonna do, how, how useful it was gonna be. And so as a physician, uh, Robert Abbey and his nephew Truman, who also worked with him in, uh, in his practice, um, even as they started using radium samples and trying them out on patients as a way to shrink tumors, they simultaneously were also trying them out on themselves. Uh, because from a bioethics standpoint, there was a principle that we can't just do something to the patient unless we are willing to accept the risk to ourselves. And so in a very kind of interesting way, you know, the same samples that they were strapping to people's bodies or having them put it in their mouth uh, to treat carcinomas in the mouth, um, they would then take that same tube and like rubber band it onto your arm, 
um, and see what happened to themselves. So self-experimentation uh, in addition to working with this. And um, Abby is one of the early pioneers of what becomes cancer treatment with radioactive substances, works out a lot of the basic principles of that um, and you know, has a long and interesting career with all of that. Um, sorry about that. Forgot to to uh, to stop my my uh, iPad. So so anyway, where where do we end up with this? Why is uh, why is Robert Abbey back with Madame Curie as a result of him uh, doing this work uh, with uh, with radium and passing this back and forth to her? Uh, he develops a long time correspondence and. He ultimately, I have a little, uh, this is a little book that was produced at, um, at, on the occasion of Abby's death. It was kind of a retrospective on his life and contained a lot of his correspondence. And this is a sample of that. You can see uh, from February 7th, 1924. And if you look over here, uh, you'll see here at the top, she and Pasteur, she's talking, he's talking here about Madame Curie, right? And he mentions, I got a delightful letter from her only yesterday, right? And why did she write the letter? Well, he had sent her a Christmas card about the swans. So he had these swans um, and he was a, a Curie super fan. You know, Robert Abbey uh, was, was, you know, just really awed by her work and was really excited about what was going on. And so he had, you know, had gotten these swans for his, his, uh, his property. And he asked if he could name them um, after uh, Marie and, and, uh, and her husband. And uh, after and Pierre, of course, had, had died at that point. But um, and so he so he names these swans. And this is just a good example of, you know, the two of them exchange correspondence uh, throughout the rest of their lives and in careers. Uh, and he was he was always, you know, really excited to talk about her work and, and to connect her to the college, uh, to the College of Physicians. Uh, and and that's how the quartz piezoelectrometer ends up in Philadelphia, right? He had when he found out that she was coming, had said to her, "Would you be willing to give something uh, to to kind of commemorate this visit uh, that we can keep as a as a memento?" And something else that I would call to your attention is uh, she sends uh, a set of of uh, and actually it's mentioned right here in the story. She sends that that book that was discussed just a second ago, the, the biography of her husband, that was, that was the contract that was discussed in the, she sent copies of that book all around America to all the places where she had visited and she signed them um, inside and, you know, as like mementos, right? So this is the biography of Pierre signed and, you know, she wrote little notes like, uh, you know, thanks for the time that I got to visit your house or whatever, right? This was her kind of souvenirs. And one of those is actually in the collection um, at the College of Physicians of Philadelphia. It was a, a nice thing that we discovered a few years ago because we knew that we had this biography in the collection and I found this, this entry where it said, well, she'd sent these signed copies around as mementos. And I thought, you know, I wonder. And so I went and pulled the book off of our shelves and opened up the front cover. And sure enough, you know, there is her, Little note, I'm pretty sure it is not Abby's. I think it was another one, another uh, person that donated theirs. But um, but uh, so that's a, a nice little kind of last connection uh, between us and the College of Physicians. And now I'll turn, the, turn it over to Dave. Thank you, Jeffrey. Great, great presentation. Okay, folks, I'm gonna just share my screen now. Michelle, I hope you're still out there. <laughs> okay, here we go. Let me get this up and I'm going to go rather quickly through this folks. Um, the uh, normal disclaimer here and to bring this home. If anybody's interested in the full version of this, and this is a sort of the same arc that Jeffrey just mentioned that radium, you know, miracle or menace, you know, the, the, a lot of, you know, the radium girls, I'm sure you're all familiar with the radium girls and those, those stories and tragic um, effects, but uh, I really want to kind of go the same medical arc that uh, Jeffrey's gone through in his book. I gave this talk last month for the Parker Foundation out in Washington State. Uh, you know, as I was watching some of these slides and, you know, Bert, your, your curies of radium being handed off, um, you know, back then, just a note, as a health, medical health physicist, there were no 
you know, radiation regulations, no, no, no statutes, no regulations. There, there we, you know, today we definitely have lots of uh, statutes, regulations, protect workers, environment, patient, public. Uh, but you know, we, we, we do always have these political societal influences and medical application is huge. Um, Laurie Taylor, who actually started with NBS uh, back in, in, in the late 20s, uh, wrote this, radiation protection is not only a matter of science, but it's a problem of philosophy, morality, and utmost wisdom. Like medicine, it's not a pure science, it's an art. And as we all know, uh, the late 1800s was just, just fu fundamental changes in physics, going from classical physics to, to the sort of quantum physics, the discovery of x-rays, Becquerel's discovery of radioactivity, and this, this wonderful discovery of, of two elements, uh, polonium initially and radium by Madame Curie and her husband, Pierre. Um, amazing, uh, you know, if I could go back in time and interview Madame Curie, I'd, I'd love, to, love to do that myself. Uh, I have to do a little shout out for, regarding the, the college's piezoelectric device. Uh, colleague, uh, late colleague of ours, uh, Sid Porter, actually discovered it was still radioactive and managed uh, some 20 years ago to decontaminate it and restore it to an operational condition. But um, the point here in this slide is, is Madame Curie really was a trailblazer. I mean, as, as Susan, Susan Marie's portrayal, she was a lone woman in a, in a man's world of science and politics. And, and she just, just, you know, just was, a, was a true tra trailblazer in the, in the world of science and women's, uh, women in science. And again, you'll hear a little shout out for, for uh, that, that STEM uh, work. What is radium? It's a, it's a decay product of uranium. It, takes, took, it took standard chemical 500 tons of uranium to produce one gram of, of, of radium. 500 tons of uranium ore from Colorado produced one gram. And that was done, as, as Joel mentioned, standard chemical in, uh, in Pittsburgh. This is the Flannery building uh, where they did a lot of the final refinements uh, there. Um, interestingly, circa 1960, the, the building was discovered to be radioactive. Um, it was decontaminated then. I came on board with the Commonwealth in 1999. It was still contaminated. We had the building uh, decontaminated with the owner at the time. Uh, that was about a $5 million cleanup uh, for that, that building. Uh, the, the area where, the, where Joel uh, showed the, the, the actual standard chemical works in Cannesburg, some of the uranium from tailings from that radium production went to the war effort during the Manhattan projects, put the federal government on the hook. Uh, in the mid 80s, $40 million closure of those, those tailings, uh, those, those uranium tailings is still out there in Cannesburg under the long-term stewardship of the Department of Energy. Um, back to the medical theme, Standard Chemical actually had a journal. Uh, this is the, one of the first issues. Um, and they found, as, as was mentioned by, by Jeffrey and others, you know, that the treatment in, in Susan Marie, the treatment of cancer was very early recognized uh, for, say, uh, cervical cancer. Uh, you know, some real cures happened back there in the early early teens. Um, here's just some some of the tubes that were produced and some of the medical applicators that were used in, in these cancer treatments. And back then, if you think about it, all you really had was X-rays, surgery, or radium. And in fact, you know, this this was debated during the 30s and into the 40s, but. Um, my point here is, is that, you know, that the, the use of radium really is, is the basis for a lot of our nuclear medicine, uh, close radiation therapies, uh, these, these seed implants, um, and teletherapy. They were actually making these quote unquote radium bombs with several grams of radium in the, tr in the 30s for teletherapy, which evolved to cobalt 60 and now these big accelerators in, in medicine. There's also this, this Quack uh, medical use, and, and Susan Marie uh, alluded to. Interestingly, a chat with Paul Frame uh, recently. This was it was in accepted practice in medicine back in the teens. Uh, the, the drinking of these these uh, these uh, elixirs and such uh, that that ended quickly, especially in the early 30s when this gentleman from Pittsburgh, who drank several bottles a day, his jaw and skull started falling apart and died a, a terrible death. This, this radium was actually a, a microcarrier of radium-226 and 228 um, that was added to distilled water. And this uh, rich industrialist died, miserable death. FDA came in, shut it all down, ended all the quackery. So production of radium, Pennsylvania has the distinction of being probably one of the major producers of radium at the day. Back in Sellersville, several grams were produced up in Sellersville. Uh, the, the Department of uh, Environmental Resources, who I work for, uh, clean that up five, six million dollars. 
Um, there's a cleanup uh, just above, still going on um, up above Pittsburgh, uh, Keystone Metal Reduction. Uh, Paul, uh, Joel Lubinow and, has uh, pointed this one out to us several years ago. And uh, we just recently, within the last uh, several years, found out where it was and doing, doing some work there to remediate it. Um, had, a, had, a had a physicist from UPenn recycling radium seeds in his basement. That was a, a cleanup in the 60s with, again, the department I work for and the F uh, Public Health Service. But then, the, again, the EPA came in under Superfund in the 90s and cleaned that up. Um, the radium dial uh, painting, the, the famous U.S. radium that was in New Jersey, moved to, 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 moved to Bloomsburg in the, uh, in the uh, late 1940s. Uh, this is a, actually the upper right is a, is a shot of that radium paint shop circa 1950, 1955 with watches, industrial uh, clocks. The, I think the cohort out in Ottawa, Illinois, the radium girls out in Illinois prompted our health department to uh, actually go look at radium uh, dial painters back in the late 30s, early 40s. This is actually a card record. Um, I, I, I redacted the name uh, from the Sellersville operation. Uh, but yeah, we, we were out, uh, my, my program goes back to the, to the late 30s. We were looking at radium dial painters back then and doing radon breath analysis. And I have to mention the, one of the first, to, probably would be called a health physicist. He was a radium salesman, but he wouldn't sell any radium to anybody in, in the Philly area, any doctors and such, until he trained them in how to actually use uh, the radium. And her, uh, Frank Hartman, his records, his diaries are at the college. I have to big shout out to Frank and all the work he did in training and finding lost radium. And these images on the upper left here are from Paul's website. Um, <laughs> amazingly, uh, several years ago, we found a gram of radium in a, in a, in a trash truck uh, for three blocks from our office wow. in, outside of Philadelphia. Just uh, the radium chemical company that uh, Bert, you know, that, that, uh, <laughs> That uh, gram transfer, we it, it was setting off alarms several trucks back. It took us thirty thousand dollars just to transfer it. It was a, out of we know where it came from, but we don't know who. Uh, but it, it was uh, a, the early brachytherapy sources out of out of a, a condo association outside of Philly. Um, sadly, there are a lot of these radium sources out there. Several years ago, north of Pittsburgh, we had several of them uh, sh shredded up, and the waste, was the, the 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 metal scrap was shipped to Ohio. Contamination in Pittsburgh and multi-million dollar cleanup Pittsburgh and, and over in Ohio. We have radium shops uh, for uh, aircraft gauges and such. Uh, we did a lot of cleanups uh, up in uh, Lock Haven, Pennsylvania. Uh, just here in Lancaster County, we had we found. Uh, eight warehouses full of radium gauges. EPA came in again, uh, thankfully, and were able to assist us in sorting through a million gauges. And they, they sorted out 400,000 radium gauges for disposal, proper disposal. And this is the old uh, US radium site up in Bloomsburg. All those buildings are down now. I actually had Paul in this building. We actually had the records for the radium dial painters, the original signed uh, uh, legal, legal documents. Uh, EPA had them all scanned in. They're now in the National Archives and you can go in and review them. That site, all the buildings are down now. Thank you EPA for, for assistance there, pulling out all these uh, gauges and such. Uh, this is the Susquehanna River and a big canal back here that had to be cleaned up. And we still, radium, our natural radium, Pennsylvania has a lot of high radium in its rocks and soils. Uh, back in the mid eighties, this gentleman was setting off alarms at the Limerick nuclear power plant as he was walking in because of the radon decay products so clinging to his clothes. 2,600 picocuries per liter. EPA standard is four picocuries per liter. We're still finding high areas around Pennsylvania. Oil and gas industry, we've got uh, Mar Marcella Shale, we did a huge study back, uh, this is our report, it's all online, May 16, and then most recently, a, a National Council of Radiation Protection uh, Committee on TNOR, Technologically Enhanced Naturally Occurring Radioactive Material, where the radium comes back with the produced water. Um, we're dealing with that. <laughs> and lastly, I just want to kind of kind of finish up here for Pennsylvania. Again, you know, the, the sort of arc with, you know, what Madame Curie and all those early pioneers did with uh, close brachytherapy, uh, teletherapy, and what we have today with photon electron therapy. We now have proton machines over in Philly that we're building one here in Lancaster, superficial. Uh, the sources, these, these implants, we now have permanent implants. When I started my career in the 
mid 70s, we were, we were using, well, we just turned over our radium seeds. We were using uh, temporary cesium seeds. And then we were starting, uh, we, I probably did the last radon seed implant up there, uh, but we were turning over to uh, I-125 seeds. All of this can be traced to, to Madame Curie's uh, work. So just to wrap up here, hopefully I got my, in my 10 minutes. Uh, um, you know, my conclusion, yeah, the discovery production of radium, impact on health. Many workers clearly were, were impacted. These radium dial painters were the basis for some of our internal radiation protection standards in, in medical health physics uh, for, for the war effort. Um, and, but I really think that, you know, the, the use of uh, you know, the, the, these in medicine over the years Really, the, the balance between the harm, yes, there was there a was number of individuals impacted their health. A lot of radium dial painters died, um, a horrible death. But I think the miracle side of this today with the benefits uh, that come out of all these uses of radioactive material, I didn't even get into industrial radiography, smoke detectors, all that, the lives that have been saved and impacted by, by radium far outweigh the, 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 the downsides over the years. So. Just to wind up here and open up for Q&A, big shout out to uh, Joel and, and Ed uh, for their wonderful book. This is a, a free online book. It's out at the, the Heinz History Center. Uh, please go, go read it. I've read it twice. It's, it's wonderful on standard chemical. Um, Bert's work on uh, Madame Curie, wonderful. Bert, the uh, outstanding uh, papers over the years. Uh, Paul Frame, all the all the amazing, all the instrument, all, just amazing collection Paul has down there in Oak Ridge. Well, he's written this all up over the years. It's all out there. This is just the, the sort of things that came out of Pennsylvania. Um, Jeff, outstanding book. You still owe me a book plate, signed book plate, man. <laughs> um, get the book, read Jeff's book. And Susan Marie, yeah, again, tonight, folks, uh, jot this down, Google STEM on stage. I saw Jen, thank you for the, for the, the notes to everybody, stemonstage.org tonight. tonight uh, you'll see the, the ticket link and, and, and thank you, Susan Marie and Jen. That is, performance is a free performance to everybody that's on this um, uh, uh, event today, this afternoon. Just type in the ticket code radium and you, or you can just Google all this and find it. It's wonderful presentation, wonderful performance. Uh, there's some music on the front end. Madame Curie, not only a wonderful scientist, she really loved the arts also. Um, and you'll hear from some, some amazing women, including Susan Marie. Um, and again, I think Madame Curie, not only in science, trailblazer in science, but a trailblazer for women in all, all fields. Uh, you know, God bless her and all the, all the work she did. And so again, just to close and open it up for some Q and A, uh, thanks again to all the folks, uh, Jackie, and all the folks at the College of, College of Medicine. All right, um, so there's been a lot of Q and A and chat um, and Jackie, um, uh, you're gonna okay. sort of read, read them I'll all. I'll read some of the questions. I just want to make a quick comment. What, what a wonderful series of presentations. Um, they're really fantastic. Um, I did just want to say to anyone who knows about Frank Hartman, the radium hound, we have actually used some of his lantern slides in our mini exhibit at the College of Physicians. So if you come by, make sure to see them. They're really amazing. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to start with the questions. I'm going to just read them in the order that they came in and we'll see how we do time wise. Um, the first question is for Bert, I think. Why was the turnover of radioactivity measurement staff so great? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I thought it was amazing. It, when I looked at that uh, roster that so many of them were gone within just a few months. And I, I think it wasn't intended to be a, a, a real employment opportunity. Uh, Noah Dorsey told him, be looking for something else to do besides handling all this radium. So uh, it, it, it's really interesting that they were doing very little research. It was strictly a, a calibration service that was being provided. Uh, and there were only one or two physicists. The, the others were lab assistants. So that's why uh, these three young women, uh, we've talked about that at, at NIST. Why did they get the job? And it may be that that was the, the best employment available for young women scientists at the time. So those three did some really nice work over the years, but most of the people shown were gone almost within six to nine months. 
Right. I, I was going to say, Bert, it's probably fortuitous also for their health that, you know, because it, it was, they were probably handling, handling fair sources. And the other thing is, I think uh, John Vilforth mentioned, I think, um, didn't NIST have some of the first film badges? They used dental film, just darkening of dental film. I think NIST was. Yes, uh, the Public Health Service did a study in 1923 uh, of that radium section. In fact, a couple of those pictures I used came from there. Uh, and they were using bits of uh, dental film on people's forehead and uh, torso. And they immediately found uh, that handling radium was, was giving uh, very high body doses and they introduced uh, some lead shields. Okay. You know, there's a bunch of notebooks in Laurie Taylor's papers um, at, the, at uh, the ones that are at Harvard. I know he's got his stuff spread out in a few places. But that was related to that early um, that Bureau of Standards office, I guess, um, from when he was there. And he wrote about the young. It was like those are they're like lab journals or something. It's been several years since I looked at them. But I had noticed the turnover in all of the staff. It sounded like it was a pretty tough. It was a pretty grueling job in the sense that they were just kind of, you know, turning through a lot of samples um, and you know just kind of doing the same thing over and over again. You know, check it, check it, check it. So I, I get the sense that that was part of it. Yeah, Laurie, Laurie Taylor came in 1926, but at the same time, uh, a Leon Curtis came uh, who had worked with Rutherford. And so he was really the first to do work in radioactivity where Larson Taylor began all that really great uh, X-ray dosimetry work from 1926. Great, thank you. Uh, Jeff, this might be something you can answer. I'm not sure. Why did Harvard refuse to give Dr. Curie an honorary doctorate? Ooh, question. I don't know. Maybe they're being cussed. <laughs> I I uh, I didn't see anything about it um, in the in the talks. I do know that um, uh, she, you know, but she was that the whole tour that was arranged um, by uh, um, someone got Maloney. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, was had a lot of uh, had a lot of PR. Uh, stuff in it and I think that as, as somebody said in one of the in one of the um, presentations a lot of that had been sort of arranged behind the scenes um, Marie Curie had you know relatively little to do about it but I don't know Susan in all of your work have you do you have any idea how she ended up in some places and not a, did Harvard snub her uh, uh, basically I mean they uh, you have to remember this is 1921 women are not yet graduating right. from Harvard they're going to Radcliffe uh, they're right. And uh, there was some discussion. I think the excuse that was put into words in some of the discussion was that, well, she hasn't done anything significant since she <laughs> died, which isn't true, but right. that you repeat a lie often enough. And they were being jerks. Uh, so uh, I, I think that's why uh, I, I'm glad that Yale decided that this is someone that was worth honoring. Hey, everybody who saw this, oh, sorry, go ahead, say whatever you're gonna say, Joel. Oh. I didn't mean to jump uh, over you. I can add to that. The, uh, the, the controversy that existed at uh, Harvard that she really didn't do any work of her own. That controversy also took place at Yale. Really? And um, there was a great deal of opposition from one person in Yale. But Yale's uh, faculty uh, overruled the objections. So if you're keeping score, Yale won, <laughs> Harvard zero. <laughs> you know, I really love that there was that picture um, where she accepted the um, accepted the award from the Women's College here in, in uh, Philadelphia. And the other woman in that picture, everybody should know, was really significant in her own right. Um, and one of the cool things that she did is she was one of the first, I believe maybe was the first woman who was inducted into the American Association for Cancer Research, which is based here in Philadelphia. And AACR was a real, you know, and remains a very prominent um, group. And they're one of those that like you, particularly in that time, you didn't get to join, like they asked you to join. And so, um, and so it was a big deal, you know, that she was, uh, that she was inducted into the organization uh, and, that was a cool, you know, that was what a was cool connection. Name? I think it's, 
Um, what was the name again? Oh gosh, I've I've I have forgotten who did that. Oh, we don't have the person who did that presentation here. Um, I'll go back and look it up. But uh, but yeah, she was the dean of the of the women's college for a long time, and was you know pretty cool in her own right. Um, and it's I think it's very great that Marie Curie went and visited the college and talked to the students and all that. That was um, that was a very a, cool story. I just she a was very question. impressed with women's colleges. Yeah. Uh, if you go back to the history, she couldn't study in Warsaw because women were not allowed to attend university. France was progressive in that it allowed women to attend and even graduate. But in the United States, uh, a more segregated approach was sort of in place for generations. As a result, at these women's colleges, there were women who were felt free to be athletic, to be have opinions, to develop their own uh, what their own strengths, and there for a different time and place there are arguments for both. But she was very impressed with the spirit and energy of the American women at these women's colleges. It was Martha Tracy. That was Martha the name, Tracy, by yeah, the way. I just want a quick quick question for Paul Frame. Paul has on his website a catalog um, that, um, and I, it was from somebody from New Jersey, Paul. I think that it has all of the old photographs from Standard Chemical, the operations out in Colorado, um, that, that you have on on your website. I guess a question for Paul or or Joel or anybody, Bert. You know, the the trip, her trip to the Grand Canyon. I do. I don't. I think I've ever seen any photographs of her out in Colorado. Um, uh, at she, the didn't, she didn't go to Colorado. Oh, she didn't make the make. No, the it was on her. It was planned for her to do so, but that was canceled as a result of her chronic fatigue. Okay. She okay. did get to the Grand Canyon. That was on her bucket list, so to speak. <laughs> and uh, but then she then rested at Grand Canyon for several days. So was that in Arizona or to the trip? Was, was that in Arizona? Where did she get? Because I, I don't remember seeing any photographs ever of her out. I haven't seen any photographs either. She stayed at El Tavar, which is a classic uh, um, residence or uh, okay. for people Arizona. visiting Grand Canyon. But yes, I, oh no, I haven't seen any photographs either. Right. Okay. Yeah. Paul, well, that catalog, you have all those photos scanned on, on your website, right? From the, the, the can. Uh, all, almost all. Uh, and they were all produced, as far as I can tell, before 1921 or so, before Marie Curie's uh, visit. Um, so, and it's, it's a hodgepodge of items. Yeah. Is, you know, question that comes has come up here just another one quickly because we're running out of time here but why was dr curie called madame or instead of doctor or professor all right in france she would have been madame dr curie or dr madame curie probably madame dr curie because they uh they wouldn't just say dr curie pierre would have been dr curie and a uh, french woman has explained to me that if say they were at a cafe talking to each other, they would have referred to each other as Dr. Curie. There's this, this formality in speaking in public to each other. Probably at home, they called each other Pierre and Marie, but uh, it, in public, they were Dr. Curie. Uh, it has been explained to me also uh, that today, even in France, whereas here in the United States, we're trying to, um, ungender everything, uh, whether you're an actor or actress, you're called actor these days the, in some schools. But in France, they're trying to recognize women are just as good as men by making sure there are female versions of all the male words of professions. So it's a different approach to a same question of recognition. But uh, anyway, madame, madame in French just means Mrs. So Madame Curie means Mrs. Curie. <laughs> but because she was doctor there, she would have been called Madame Dr. Curie. Here in the United States, the Madame is what came Start. up. All right, Jackie. So, so, you know, as long as we're, we're mentioning that, something that I think is incredibly cool about her story is, you know, she's that quartz piezoelectrometer right 
her research is made possible because Pierre had done this work in yes. developing that amazing instrument, right? And so she is there as a graduate student, you know, saying, what is my research project going to be? And she's got all these things lying around, right? And gets access, uh, you know, to the, to the, um, to the ore uh, through, a, through a cool relationship she, that she had with the local kind of chemical house. Uh, and then it's like, because she had those instruments, that's why she can do the kind of precise measurement that is required then, you know, she kind of puts all those pieces together. And I really love that story about, you know, you can, you, it, it's hard to imagine her, this, this story, you know, she was brilliant, so she would have done something. But this story was a story about, you know, that, that relationship and that relationship in the lab enables this amazing, you know, career. And I, I always think that that's such a cool uh, bit of luck or bit of, um, it is. bit of fortune. Even before well, that, well, that his, uh, the Curie point in magnetism is when a metal reaches a certain temperature and the magnetic properties change or disappear, that's named for Pierre Curie. She had been studying magnetism and I like to say it's magnetism that brought them together. <laughs> Yeah. But oh, even oh. but to, to uh, emphasize what you said, Becquerel discovered radioactivity. I mean, he right. observed it and reported on it first. She, but that was all qualitative. Right. And she wanted to make quantitative measurements. So uh, that's where the access to this electrometer, and it's not just the it's not just the piezoelectric scale. It's combining that with the right. quadrant electrometer and the chamber uh, together. That apparatus that I'm sure when she was saying, "Okay, how can I measure this? What can we measure right. so I can make it quantitative?" So absolutely, it was that collaboration that that led to the uh, progress. Paul, you were going to say something, Paul? Yeah, I, I was going to say, it seemed to me that you didn't need the piezo electrometer component. Right? You just need uh, the quadrant electrometer coupled to the ion chamber uh, where the sample was contained. That's what Rutherford used. Yeah. I don't know of any other uh, well, groups so the, the PSO electrometer. So I might be um, like, feel free to yell at me that I'm out of my wheelhouse. But my understanding <laughs> is that the real value of using the piezo electrometer is you know, remember they start out with these extremely large samples, right? That contain very, very little um, radium in them. And that they had a setup in the lab that, you know, sort of one of the key things that she was really able to do was to figure out how to isolate this tiny quantity of the truly radioactive stuff, the polonium and the radium out of the much larger um, pitch blend samples that they had. Uh, now, you know, like, um, again, I'm not a chemist uh, or a physicist, so maybe I'm wrong about that. But that was from reading their kind of notes and descriptions of what they were doing. That was my understanding was that they were they were using the piezo electrometer as part of this kind of process of comparative reduction. Um, of, what, uh, what, of I, what I find what I find amazing, though, to Paul's point is, is, is this and I mentioned this to somebody just in the last couple of days, the simplicity of the instruments that were, yeah. were used. And you can go up to um, McGill and see a lot of Rutherford's early instruments up up at McGill and the, uh, the library was the old yeah. building and such. And, yeah. and amazingly, the NBS was using not an electrometer, but an electroscope for heaven yeah. 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 for And they're so sensitive, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. like her her instruments were really, you know, comparable to instruments that would be used at least in some places today, which is really cool, right? And I mean, nothing her... plugs into the wall. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> there was no, there was no wall socket back then either. <laughs> so, so I'm gonna I'm gonna ask uh, uh, Jackie just to uh, see if we can pick up. You know, one, we had a couple. We're a couple minutes over, but if, you know, maybe maybe a couple well, more. I was questions. going to um, say that maybe we can use panelists' privilege. I think there were a couple of panelists who wanted to ask questions to each other. Should we allow one of those as the final question because we are out of time pretty much? Well, Paul, um, Paul, you, you, that was, did you have a question, Paul? Earlier? Yeah, no questions. Does <laughs> okay. anybody no, else? I, I, I am going to, I am going to, so what I've, what I've got everybody on, I just want to, again, thank everybody for all their time. Jackie, all the effort with the college and the museum. Uh, I definitely want to go over and see this, this exhibit live, and I'd encourage everybody to do that. 
Uh, we still have over 100 participants on listening, so that there is some interest out there. I, I'm gonna, and I think I suggested this in an email. All of these presentations can go, you know, uh, an, an hour each. I'm gonna suggest that we line up some health physics chapters and and do this, you know, uh, over over an extended uh, period of you know several months. Maybe have have one one lecture a, a month or something, and, and do the full 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 banana here. <laughs> All right. So on that point, um, and again, I just wanted for Susan Marie, everybody, um, uh, you know, go to stemonstage.org. Yep, please come tonight. We've got yeah, some tonight. more programs later in June as well. Yep. Yep. See Susan Marie. Um, and again, wonderful job as, as Madam Curie, uh, Madam C Dr. Curie. <laughs> wonderful. <laughs> and, and I wish Robert, Dr. Hicks could have been here with us and Ed Landa. You know, look up all, all it, you will get all this information. Uh, keep an eye on your email if you've registered for this event. You'll get a Word document with a lot of links and, and, and all these uh, presentations and Paul's website and, and Bert's work. And, Thank yeah. you, David and Joel, for putting this together. Well, I really appreciate this multifaceted and having a chance to converse with you. It's a real treat. It's been, been a lot of, lot of fun. <laughs> and I, I'm going to go up and pour myself a glass of wine, I think, Paul, <laughs> <laughs> at this point, or a shot of Zambuca in my coffee. Okay. <laughs> Jackie, do you want to you close us out? <laughs> I just want to say thank you to everybody that, that um, signed up and attended today. Uh, I think it's been a wonderful group of presentations. And as Dave said, everything, you know, we're going to send you some sort of some homework after this so you can read and find out more. And I hope that maybe sometime in the next year or two, we can, you know, remember the, the, the anniversary again, actually in person at the College of Physicians. But in the meantime, it would be great if you came by and saw our little mini exhibit um, to honor the very, very amazing Madam Dr. Marie Curie.